Um, well, first, a, uh, first, a shout out. Um, first of all, again, I'll, I think it's important to, to, to give some praise here to, to you students for organizing this. This is no, no small feat. I've been um, uh, kind of speaking off and on uh, since the early, early years. It's always a, a, great, uh, a great event, and I, I recommend it frequently to peers. Um, second shout out. Uh, and many students I see in the audience here um, from uh, my finance classes and from um, uh, Huadong Energy Corporation, um, uh, some other students that are brave, brave enough to join us here at Duke for two months, part of Power China, building gigawatts of, uh, of clean power uh, around the world. So the, the way this will work, uh, um, I'll ask a few questions to get us started. Uh, hopefully, you'll be uh, posting questions uh, through this newfangled technology here. Uh, I'll get those on an iPad and or uh, raise your hand. So our goal is to, is to really make it interactive, not just say that, but actually to engage, engage the audience uh, sooner than later. So, um, you know, uh, a, a, a focus that I think is really important in the discussion of next generation energy is that, yes, the technology is really important, uh, but how you finance that probably is, is more important. We've heard a lot about how, how solar uh, has, has grown around the world. It's not because, say, that the, the efficiency of panels has improved dramatically. It's because uh, financial models, business models have, have changed dramatically. Um, so, uh, so I'll start um, kind of with, with um, uh, you know, maybe who we are and then, uh, again, a, a question or two. So, um, so I, have, I, wear, I wear two hats. Um, one, uh, I'm an executive in residence at the Nicholas School of the Environment, the, the um, kind of a sister school here on campus. Um, where I teach courses on uh, environmental finance, clean ed energy finance, uh, and then I run a, a boutique investment bank called Iron Oak Energy, and we raise capital exclusively for uh, clean energy companies. Uh, so, so lots of fun. We have here um, on, the, on the panel um, uh, uh, executives who, who play different roles in the ecosystem of financing uh, energy uh, innovation, uh, almost in, in, not quite in order, but, but yes, early stage, seed stage, uh, to, you know, to, to utilities, partnering, uh, startups needing to partner with utilities, and, and I think maybe utilities needing to partner with startups to, to be less disrupted, um, uh, mutual success, we'll say. Um, so maybe we'll start with, you know, where do you play within the niche um, uh, of financing next generation energy innovation? So we talked about, you know, is it uh, technology or assets, early stage, uh, late stage, uh, et cetera. Sure. Paul? Yeah, so Paul Straub with Wireframe Ventures, uh, MBA 05 here, so pleased to be back. And, and really, for the last uh, decade or so, I've been investing in, in energy technology uh, as a primary focus. So with Wireframe, which is a new fund, uh, what we're doing is dedicated seed in, in, in the valley. Now we have this thing called pre-seed stage investing, which usually means first institutional check. And, and that's where we have seen kind of a, a distinct lack of institutional capital uh, in, in the themes we care about, one of the primary themes for us is resource efficiency. So that encompasses a lot of things. It is energy, it is water, it is ag, it is uh, manufacturing, it is industrials, the efficiency of those industries, transportation. So I'd say when you think about kind of our aperture, we certainly have an interest in, in power gen and, and, and the electric grid, but I think we look at the impact of, of innovation around energy much more broadly than, than just that focus. And so, um, you know, for us, what we're looking for are great uh, uh, people. You know, we think about kind of getting involved in a people flow and getting to know people who are working on really big challenges that can build great product, because at the early stages, what you're looking for are people who have a vision to build something that can be very large, can be high terminal value, but to get there, you have to start with building a great product and getting it to market. And so that's the stage that we tend to want to finance. Um, and I'll stop there for a moment. And when you say early stage, you're always seeking to invest, like what kind of dollar amounts, what stage of a company, roughly? Right, so our checks usually start at, at three to 500K, uh, and that can be the only check in a round, or it can be part of a, a syndicate. And, and we're happy to do either. We're happy to lead. We're happy to work with others. We've invested in, in rounds that are, you know, the most recent one was a, a $5.5 million round, and you know, we were a piece of that. So uh, we try to be, be flexible as long as it kind of fits the other parameters for us. Um, the only, and then you know, the, the other thing that we do is we say, look, we're going to put our time and capital in early, so we hope to be able to write one more check at that next round as we build a syndicate that's maybe a million and a half to $2 million. Um, and, and that's kind of where we start to pull back. And maybe just one last question to make that more tangible. Can you give us an example of a company you've, you'll have financed recently? 
Sure. Uh, the most recent companies actually solving one of the challenges that Fred was talking about here earlier, which is corporate procurement of renewables. It's a company called Level 10 Energy. They're based out of Seattle, and they're trying to much better align project, large-scale project developers with uh, corporate buyers. Two-thirds of the Fortune 500 has targets they're trying to hit with renewable procurement. It's a lengthy, high-friction process that takes expertise most companies don't have. And they're basically trying to create portfolios. Their first portfolio is 440 megawatts in PGM, where they construct portfolios that allow uh, large corporations, and hopefully at some point much smaller corporations, to, to procure renewable energy similar to, to, to the way that, you know, mutual funds kind of opened up the market for, for smaller investors to, to buy into funds and, and make investments. So, so while, while the projections about the, the, the need and growth in corporate PPAs sounds great, and it is great, it's the execution which is sometimes uh, tricky, so they're solving a, solving a pain point here. Yep. Great. Chris, I heard you just hang out with uh, Bill Gates all the time, is that? Yeah. <laughs> I wish that were the case. Um, so uh, Chris Poirier with Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and that is the, the fund that, that Bill Gates announced last year um, with a billion dollar commitment, and he's brought a, a, a group of globally successful um, influencers, business influencers who happen to also be billionaires together to create a, a, a very large fund. Um, it's a, a for-profit, long-duration fund. It's a 20-year fund, so it's very patient capital. And that's, I think that allows us to, to, to be um, very flexible in terms of what we will look at. Um, we have a, a, a very specific climate impact requirement, and that is um, any investment that we make has to have the potential to reduce a half a gigaton a year of GHG emissions. And that's, it's sort of binary. Um, and then from there, it's, a, it's stage agnostic, so we can invest as little as $50,000 in a research project at a university to solve a problem for us, and up to $50 million in a single check into a transaction. So it's, when I say stage agnostic, it, it really is. Um, beyond that, it's also geographically agnostic, and, and we want to solve problems all around the world, and we want to find innovators um, from where they're, wherever they're innovating. Um, it's a big, uh, we're looking for to solve big problems, and we want we want to encourage the innovator community to think big, and we hope to fill a gap that we believe ha currently exists in the market with this uh, with this long duration capital. Right. So just to be clear, when 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 Chris says uh, patient, this is like very patient uh, capital. I mean, you know, Paul, the duration of of your old funds is ten years. Right. Yeah. At, 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 the, at the high end, right? So, so certainly unique in the market. Mm -hmm. um, so um, th this gigaton of impact, r reducing a gigaton of, of GHGs, is there a time frame considered for, for that investment? Well, it's a 20-year fund. Uh -huh. uh, so it's so a it's similar a, time frame it, for that impact? It's a, similar, it's a similar timeline. OK. What would be, uh, I don't know, a, a sample, not that you've made these yet, but a, but a, a sector, perhaps, or type of investment that could reach that scale? Sure. Um, I mean, the panel before us was talking about energy, you know, grid scale energy storage, certainly. Agricultural technology, so food waste represents about 12% of global GHG emissions. There are a number of other, other sectors, transportation electrification, um, manufacturing, um, building materials, buildings, efficiency. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that meet that, that metric. Got it. Trey, so different, different end of the spectrum. We talked earlier about, uh, about your, your fun role as, as CFO to also be considering the, 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 the role of innovation at a, a large place like SCNE. Yeah. Um, and that's right. My name is Trace Petmakey, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Southern California Edison. And before I get started, I would like to pause and echo your, your comments earlier and thank the conference committee for their hospitality. We really appreciate it. And I am at Southern California Edison. Um, we're a little bit different in the sense that we're just over 130 years old. We have some assets. <laughs> just a touch exactly. Just we have some assets we'd appreciate over 50 years, some hydro assets. So it is. It's a much different um, business, but we're all integrated. And being in Southern California, just California, we are probably the most advanced state when it comes to disruption. And we as a company like that disruption. So it's a very exciting place to be. And I'm gonna pause for a second and note that I grew up in Houston, Texas. I have four kids that were born in Los Angeles. 
So this World Series has been a little tough on our house. We, we're house divided. But, and this isn't just a shameless plug for the world champion Houston Astros. Um, but it is to say, when I left Houston, it was, and this is 20 some odd years ago, it was a fossil fuel based economy. That's what everybody did. Coming to California, I thought folks were a little bit crazy. So I was on the other end of the spectrum. I look at California over the last probably 30 some odd years, we've been very, very progressive. And very progressive in small ways and some big ways. Although a lot of it's been very small steps, it started with the oil embargo and people wanted to move to energy efficiency. So just using less kilowatt hours. It's a tough thing for utilities to accept, but having a very forward looking commission, they did what they call decoupling meaning they separate our revenues from our sales. And that allowed the utilities to continue to profit even if our customers were <laughs> using less electricity. So that was kind of the first step of a big change. And that was 30 some odd years ago. Then you look at environmentalism. And when I moved to California, people talked about two things, smog and they talked about traffic. And those were big, big problems in California, especially in the LA Basin 20 years ago. During that time, the commission, the state, our company said we have to do something about that. We stopped buying coal, so that went aside and we, we have no coal anymore. And then we put in a 33% renewable standard. Again, growing up in California or in, in Houston, I said these Californians are crazy. We'll never stop using base load coal. We need base load coal. We need the spinning reserve. Second, that happened. We, we don't have coal anymore. And then second, the renewable standard. I said, well, that's a neat idea, but it, it's not going to work. Sure enough, we're hitting that target well before the, the mandated period. Even going up to 50%, we just put a white paper out that's saying that we could get to 80% by 2030, including some hydro and other, um, what I'll say, renewable assets or non-greenhouse gas emitting assets. So we've really made some huge strides, but the more important piece to me personally is that I walk out and I look out my office and I see the mountains that are about five miles away that I couldn't see 20 years ago, and we don't have smog that, there's a little bit of smog in LA, but it's not the smog alerts that we had 20 years ago. And it's, I'm proud to say our company had a role in that. And if you all want to have a role in that, come out to California because we are doing it. Learn how to do it and then spread it around the country. And it's, it's a really neat deal. So that's kind of where we stand. But please don't everyone go to California. <laughs> we need a, you know, smart folks in the Southeast as well. Um, so, so you know, our topic is, is financing uh, th this innovation. You know, cost of capital is a big part of the discussion. I think you're clearly different cost of capital at, at the end versus, <laughs> versus you gentlemen here. Um, maybe, Trace, just to continue with, with you, so I think about cost of capital and, and you know, many utilities move into funding things like um, you know, EV charging infrastructure. Um, great low cost way to do that, also benefiting you know, both EV uh, users, consumers, uh, and also boosting um, you know, slow demand or lack of d d demand growth. Yep. Um, can you comment about how Ural's cost of capital um, you know, helps with innovation, both Absolutely. either for Ural's work and or the, the other external you, you would partner with? Yep, absolutely. And it, it, I love this topic. It's fascinating to me. And it's, Southern California is a little bit different than a lot of companies, but at the end of the day, we're very similar. First, I'll remind everyone we're a regulated utility. We have a regulated rate of return. We're going to earn on, on our equity 10.3%. That's what we get. We don't get more than that. We don't get less than that. If we do, it's just around the edges. But that's what our business model is. And then whatever our debt cost, we just flow that through to the rate payers. So we are a low cost, cost of capital compared to others, but we do have a 50-50 debt equity split. So a lot of startups will load up on leverage, use a lot more less expensive debt, but that is a riskier proposition. We don't do that. But again, that's because we have an, a regulated authorized rate of return. Um, what's interesting to me, and I think there's just a huge opportunity if we work together as partners, that we buy or spend about $8 billion every year. So every year we're writing checks for $8 billion. And that's separated into two groups. One group are things that we buy um, and we don't finance. So 
um, purchase power contracts. We'll buy that in over a 20-year period. We'll pay a certain amount each year for the generation, and that generator will finance that. And they take on a lot of risk doing that. But that's a competitive market, and it's good. Alternatively, there's the other $4 billion that we spend, and we finance that. So we just buy it outright. Some examples there, the one that comes to mind for a lot of folks in utilities are poles. We buy the pole, the person that sold it to us didn't do any financing of that pole. We take it and we'll finance it over 30 years, again, at our 10.3% equity return, say 8.9% overall return on that asset. Um, what's beneficial to the pole manufacturer is they don't have any upfront financing, but then again, they're not earning any return on that asset besides just the, the sales margin. But those are two very different business models for people selling us things. And where it becomes very interesting is in the new environment, the new market of, say, a battery. What is batteries? What are batteries? Are they like a purchase power contract where we'll just take the output and the seller will finance it? Or is it much more like a distribution asset, such as a pole, whereas we'll buy the battery and we'll finance it over time? So there's just a lot of opportunity if people are willing to partner and think very open-mindedly about things. And again, we, we love this new technology and we want to make technology work well and we want to lead the country in all of this. So we, we think these opportunities are wonderful. And Chris and Paul, um, slightly more risk tolerance, let's say. Um, and maybe not, without describing you know, specific you know, financial IRR you know, return targets, how would you describe, say, a, a portfolio, the kind of number of deals? And obviously, it's not the same return you're targeting for every deal. Many are, I, I presume, in typical VC, not in your, in your funds, in typical VC, many deals would fail, right? Um, how, how do you think about it on a portfolio, the kind of swinging for the fence equity multiple or IRR that you're, you guys are, yeah, are I after? Think, I think my answer is going to be a little bit different uh, than Paul's in that, mm -hmm. A, it's a 20-year fund, and B, we, we are very stage agnostic. So we're going to have very True. small investments, very large investments, and everything in between. So, um, but as it, as it pertains to return expectations, they have to be commensurate with the stage and the risk that we're, that we're taking in that particular investment. And they have to be com commensurate with our partners. We, want, we, we look to create syndicates, create partnerships, whether they're with corporates or with other um, stage appropriate investors. And that's, that's a big thing for us. We, we really want to go out and engage our peers and create profitable impact investments. Okay, Paul, how about yourself? Yeah, for, for us, uh, I'm sure my LPs would love if I could draw a line between each investment and the target return rate of 10.3%. <laughs> 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 so we think about it at a portfolio level, and, and we have actually a similar set of targets to any early stage, seed stage venture investor, which is we have a set of LPs who are mission aligned with us in terms of some of the things we're investing. We also have pure financial LPs. So that means we need to deliver on a net basis between three and four X kind of fund after fund to be at the top of, of, of our kind of competitive set. And so when we think about portfolio, that means we need to be able to take a fair bit of risk early and then be very disciplined about where we commit follow on capital. So if you think about a 40 or so company portfolio and having an appetite for, for you know, some real level of loss, it means we're gonna lose probably half the companies at least between a first and second check and then having the experience of working with the companies and seeing them get into market, we hope to write one more check as we build a syndicate behind that core portfolio of 20 or so companies which should deliver the kind of return profile which I have mentioned, three to four X uh, net on a fund. And to what degree are you looking at companies that are, have you know, business model interruption versus you know, more technology focused? Um, innovation. We, we look at both. So the, the, it's interesting. Out of the first couple companies, you know, one is the level 10, which I mentioned. One is actually in the ag food waste space. It's a marketplace for institutional food and beverage companies. So that's more of a business model innovation, technology enabled. But we are happy to invest in hard technologies as long as they're not pure science. So what we don't like is you know, material science, science risk, discovery risk companies. But we're happy to invest in product development and engineering risk. We tend to look at things that are IT driven or hardware that has an IT enabler. But I mean, we are looking at some stuff that's you know, kind of Jetsons pretty far out there you know, using, you know, people have talked about wireless power for automobiles. We're actually looking at a company right now doing wireless power for aviation 
I think about drones to start, not passenger planes, but but you know, kind of proven technology <laughs> that that they're looking at how do you how do you start to re reduce the need for for ICE and for fuel or battery load on on on. Uh, devices that fly. And so, you know, we're, we're happy to actually look at some things that are a little bit out there, um, because if they work, they could, they could be pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. so. you, you, we talked about risk just a little bit more, again, more on the side of the, the chairs. What are some ways that, um, that, 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 I guess all three of you, but would, would, would mitigate the risks of your investments? I mean, certainly the, the core due diligence of, you know, team and all the rest, but what are some that stand out for you all? I mean, for us, we have, um, we're split into three three teams within Breakthrough Energy Ventures. It's the investing team, the technology team, which is the deepest of our teams. We have, we have um, subject experts in all of our key areas of thesis, investment thesis and interest. Um, and then we have company builders, which are mm. former operators who have considerable experience in starting, building, growing companies, um, and partnering with different pools of capital in doing so. Um, and so it's a highly collaborative environment. We will, we will invest in pure science because we have, we have folks not just within our team but within our broader network that understand the science. Um, and we want, to, we want to encourage bold, big ideas. Um, and so we, we're not risk averse in that regard. Um, we will also invest in business model innovation or at the nexus of business model innovation and technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're doing some really creative things that span, that, that are representative of literally the, the earliest stage all the way through, um, you know, even considering some distressed assets in combinations with mature technologies or combinations of different complementary businesses um, and partnering with the, the folks who are, who are um, partnered with them and invested in those companies and, and creating a, you know, a one plus one plus one equals five sort of situation. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but we are very much um, in support of big, bold technology, technology plays for, for impact. Great. Terrius, how about yourself? How do you think about, think about mitigating risks on this, um, uh, on this edge? Being a regulated you, utility, we think a lot about risk. Mm -hmm. We're very risk adverse. But that really comes down to the commission and making sure the Public Utilities Commission approves the spending that we're doing. So for us, especially with new technologies, it's partnering with folks like Paul and Chris and working through solutions. One of the ones that we're very proud of currently are, is some battery technology that we have put in, in partnership with one of our peaking units. So the peaking unit used to have to fire up very quickly, and that's just really tough on the machinery mm -hmm. at, a, at a peaking unit. By putting battery in front of that unit, instead of having to ramp up, we can discharge the battery while the, the peaking unit is ramping up slowly. And working together with two vendors, we were able to put together a package we can take to the commission and show them the benefit compared to the cost exceeds one, so it's a, it's a good investment. So we just really want to partner with those vendors, especially with new technologies. So a, a hybrid approach, right? Com combining a, a new, new tech with, with uh, conventional energy, let's say. That's exactly right. Got it, okay. That's right. Um, you, you mentioned some of, this, uh, some of the things that you've, you, you, you like already. Um, are, are there, this is maybe for the, for the students and, and audience, broader audience kind of benefit, are there sectors where you think it's, um, too competitive, or, or the, the branding is such that, that, that the you know investor expectations are, are, are so you know jaded that, that raising capital, placing capital in certain business models, sectors, et cetera, are are just too tough right now. So I, I would say that one of the our primary lens is, is is what is a fit for Wireframe Ventures, meaning there we, we we look for kind of the projects that make sense for our return profile, risk profile. And so I don't necessarily get into, hey, you know, that's just a bad area to invest. It's more of a, hey, that's, that we, we don't think that's a great area for us to invest. I would say that, that from uh, things that right now kind of fall outside of that, for us, I talked about, you know, pure material science risk or, or companies that take, you know, it would need a fair amount of capital, in, in some cases, building, tooling, and plant to prove that they can build a product. You know, that just means that they're not going to be able to show enough progress on a relatively small seed stage check. For, 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 for us to be able to, to get them through that, that mm -hmm. risk phase to a higher valuation point. 
Uh, the other thing that, that, that I think a lot, I've seen a lot of people, of entrepreneurs working on problems around uh, you know, data and using data for uh, lowering acquisition costs in Resi Solar, as an mm -hmm. example, or, 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 or aggregating building data and, and, or, or being able to do some level of kind of management of DERS. And, and I think those are all interesting areas, but one of the things I would say is that there's just a lot of noise, and so what we look for is someone who could break through and, and have something that's scalable, because there's a lot of people who are working on solutions that don't necessarily have a lot of defensibility or maybe challenging to scale. And so ultimately, um, that makes it tough to build high margin, high growth, high terminal value companies that you know, kind of is what makes venture go, go round. Mm -hmm. Chris? Um, at the end of the day, I don't think there isn't, there, there's, there's anything specific that we won't look at. Mm -hmm. um, we don't think that there's anything that's particularly bad. Um, you know, investing in traditional fossil fuel um, endeavors is probably not on the list, but that's sort of the nature of our, uh, of our organization, which is a little bit ironic because I spent 12 years in the coal industry. Um, and that sort of is representative of the diversity of our team. It was a clean coal technology company. So <laughs> I know that may be, they seem like a little bit of an oxymoron. Um, but, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I, it's interesting. I, 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 I spent a lot of time in the traditional power space. Um, and it, we bring, to, we bring to, the, to the party a very diverse view of the world, literally. Um, if you look at our, our board and the broader Breakthrough Energy Coalition, um, it's a very impressive roster of individuals who have enormous influence and enormous insight and enormous reach into virtually every region of the world. So that coupled with the, the real diversity of our team um, allows us to look at things that may be viewed by other firms as really hard, really hard mm -hmm. problems or really tough places to, to invest. And we try to get comfortable. I mean, we want to solve hard problems. That's what we're. That's what we're here to do: solve really hard problems, and uh, you know, and take our, you know, take our very unique structure, and get people comfortable with the fact that we're there to support them. Great. Trace, how about yourself? Um, Off limits areas for you guys. Well, for competition, we actually really appreciate competition. We're a buyer when it comes right down to it. So whether that's people competing to sell us electricity, and we've seen that market, it's, it's amazing what it's done to drive prices down. Um, first in the, in the wind sector, now the solar, the pricing is just remarkable that we're seeing. So we love that competition. And then when it's on the other side, um, just the normal, I'll say batteries or um, poles and the more typical distribution assets, we love the competition there. So we, we like the competition and we think that we are a platform, we the utility are a platform that the smaller companies can compete because we do have a big spending dollar. Got it. How about in terms of um, financial mechanisms that are of interest to you all or, or, or not perhaps? So things like you know, uh, PACE, property assessed, clean energy bonds, more asset focused, um, securitization of different revenue streams, um, crowdsourcing perhaps. Are, are, are any of these or others out there um, supportive of, competitive with, helpful to uh, your all's um, existing models? So we, we love PACE. I'm, I'm one of the early investors in a company called Renew Financial. And the CEO of that company is the inventor of PACE. Uh, and so it's, you know, I think that we, we look at uh, what we invest in are pure equity kind of, you know, models. So we, we, we invest at corporate equity dollars. But we like financial innovation, like PACE, or like the portfolios that Level 10 is putting together as a way of driving uh, adoption of efficiency or, 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 or financing kind of uh, deployment in the market. And so um, I think those, you know, I think it's, it's important to continue to, 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 to think about, you know, are there better, more efficient ways to finance uh, new classes of assets? And, and you're starting to see some people do that with storage. There's a company in, in San Francisco called Generate Capital. They just announced a $200 million raise. They're doing great things out on the cutting edge. They finance a couple hundred million dollars of, of uh, energy storage and other projects that would be viewed as kind of on the edge of bankability. But you know, when you actually get into it, have a pretty good return profile. So we're not involved with Generate, but I like people who are looking at innovative solutions for, for playing in a space where maybe traditional financiers and banks are, aren't yet comfortable. 
And, and how about something like um, like an, uh, an ICO? Is that something that, that <laughs> it competes with uh, your, your all's flavor of, of venture capital? I was just exchanging emails with an entrepreneur this morning who's uh, planning to do an ICO in a couple of weeks and uh, is still going to do an equity piece. That I, I think ICOs, uh, so initial coin offerings, right, are, are, have been a huge, I'll say, bubble this year in terms of a way to raise capital. And there's going to be some fallout, I'm sure, from that. But I also think it's really interesting because if you think about, you know, at its core, it's a it's 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 crowdsourcing, right? It's, it's it's crowdsourcing, customer sourcing your financing for deployment of something. But you still have all the challenges of building a product, of building and hiring and managing a team, of figuring out how to deploy that, like all of the operational things that you actually have to do to make that cryptocurrency worth something and fulfill on the promises you've made to your future customers who've bought it. You still have to do, which means there's value in having thought partners and people who are experienced in helping create and build companies along, and usually that means having some equity investment as well. Mm -hmm. So I actually think you'll see a hybrid. My, my view is you'll, you'll see a hybrid model, and, 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 and this ICO thing is going to take some time to sort out. But I think it will be an important uh, mechanism for, for some companies where that is core to the value of the service they can provide to consider. Great. Thanks. Chris? That, um, well, certainly, I don't, I don't personally view ICOs as, um, as something that is competitive with what we do, just in terms of things that we're investing in. Um, I don't think that's really an option for, for most, of the, most of the companies that we're But in terms of the other uh, mechanisms and the other, uh, other pools of capital, I think we view that as complementary. Um, we are an equity investor. That's, that's, we're going we're to stick to that knitting. Um, and we do have a, lot, a fairly large pool of capital available to us. Um, and, and that pool of capital continues to, to get incrementally larger with the addition of, addi uh, the addition of more folks on our board and, and, and people as part of the coalition. But um, as we look at our, at our projects, as we look at our, uh, at our investment opportunities, and they're spread all over the globe, if we don't consider um, very diverse sets of complementary financial instruments, it's, it'll make it more challenging for us to help support these companies from um, you know, inception through. Mm -hmm. Full life cycle. That's right. OK. That's right. I think I mentioned we're a 130-year-old company. <laughs> so oh, we. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nothing in ICO. <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> we stick. Forget ICO. Yeah. That's here. right. I see. Um, it, we stick with very traditional financing. Um, the equity that we raise for Southern California Edison and our parent Edison International we haven't raised equity in years, and we don't intend to. We generate equity from our earnings. So we go out, we raise between a billion and $2 billion everywhere in the debt markets. And we believe that market is very, very efficient. And having the ability to get that money from those markets, we don't feel that there's a need for, for other financing vehicles. That's important to me, because I think there are other companies out there that are really trying to solve problems. And they should be focused on solving those problems. And they can lean on us to raise that capital. So I think there's just a huge opportunity here if we can figure out the right procurement strategy where we can buy things included in our financing. And that will give them the opportunity and the time and the focus on solving problems as opposed to working through the financing. That's right. We were just talking before the, uh, before the panel started about our initiative, break, Breakthroughs Initiative, to, to reach out, and we were talking at lunch, uh, to reach out to um, folks in the strategic region, other financial investors and innovators, whether they're in research labs or in universities or, um, or elsewhere, and really create partnerships. So the kind of partnership that we would envision with a, a Southern California Edison would be one where we bring, we take the, the the technology risk we take, we bring the equity capital, and we we leverage, you know, the strategic nature of their position in the market to bring new products to, new products and, and scale and create more rapid adoption. So mm -hmm. I see that as as very complementary. And I think what I heard Trace say to you guys is, if you have an energy startup, go to him for for cheap debt funding. Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. Like after, after this session. Um, so I think there are questions maybe coming uh, to me on a tablet at some point soon here. But um, w one question I want to get answered from you all before those, those come is um, uh, career advice. Um, one, one, two thoughts on advice 
uh, for a room, not entirely full of students, but we all need career advice, me, myself included. Um, <laughs> I, I'm listening and taking notes, so Paul, you wanna start? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think, it, I think it comes down to having, you know, kind of personal conviction around the things that, that are important to you and, and, and what, you know, how you wanna construct a career. And, and, it, and I think the, the one piece of advice I'd, I'd have kind of coming from, you know, the Bay Area, which is, I think probably more progressive than is healthy in some cases in terms of the time. We, we all think that things are gonna happen like tomorrow and we're most of the time wrong, but I think a lot of, uh, <coughs> of, of the industries that we're deeply involved in think that things are gonna take longer to happen than actually will. So if you're looking out over the course of a 20 or 30 year career, I think the question is you know, not just judging based on the last five years or 10 years, kind of what does an industry structure look like because the areas we're talking about are going through rapid and dramatic change and so it's really taking a view that maybe looks ahead a little bit and saying in 10 years, where are, are, could things be if kind of things line up? And if you wanna be in a dynamic position, either taking the risk to get involved in private companies or figuring out who are you know, kind of some of the more um, uh, forward thinking and, and, and kind of you know, larger companies that are deeply engaged in that innovation and, and finding a way to get involved uh, with those. Because I think they're gonna kind of end up being uh, in, in, in the best position for, for you know, industry shifts. Great. I'd say, Chris. I'd say, um, surround yourself with good people. Yeah. You know, really, I, I, and I think I've I've made a career of doing that. And the, the quality of people that you surround yourself with, whether you're you're just starting out um, and you're going to work for a, a larger company, evaluate the people, because that's going to be very important in terms of your your success. Um, and don't be afraid to take a risk. Um, you know, I admitted at lunch that I'm a I'm a risk junkie. Um, and and I, you know, I've, I've started or run six, six companies over my career over 25 years, and some of them have been uh, wildly successful, and others have been epic failures. And without question, I, I, I would do it again. Um, and take that risk, especially when you, well, when you can. Ditto. <laughs> no, that's not fair. We that's all the good not, stuff. That's, but starting with Paul's comments that do what you love, love what you do. Get up every morning and really be proud of what it is that you're doing and enjoy it and absolutely surround yourself by good people and people you enjoy working with that are like-minded but not identically minded. Make sure that they challenge you and think differently. Again, Astros fan, family, Dodgers fan. <laughs> At work, I came in thinking differently, and it was a good partnership. Um, also, I agree on taking risk. I jumped from the utility to work for an IPP just as it was going bankrupt. Um, maybe it wasn't the best decision, but in hindsight, I learned more than I ever learned, and I made the best friends that I've ever known. So do those sorts of things. I will ask you all, though, just based on our socks, who do you think is the utility person and who's not? <laughs> you got me there. But I did work yeah, me in, too. I worked, me in the, too. I worked in the coal industry. Yeah. And, I, and I share something in common with you in that I'm a, I'm, I'm, I live in Boston. I was born and bred in Boston. And I have a, uh, a son who's a Miami Dolphins fan. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> And it's just, it's unbearable. It's, just, it's absolutely unbearable. <laughs> So I've got a great list of questions here. I, I would just add, and I've mentioned some of this to you before, uh, kind of one-on-one. In addition to this great advice, um, hustle, which used to be not such a great word, is a great word and a great skill to have. Hustling and showing up, you, you'd be surprised how, how uncrowded that last mile is. Um, and, and people like those on stage notice that, that self-starter nest, that, that hustle. So beyond getting well-educated and well-connected, the hustle factor, the self-starter factor is, uh, is huge. Uh, all right, how about, um, let's pick a good two or few questions here. What is the number one thing you look at when deciding to make an investment and or what is a major deal breaker? People. For you guys? People. That's Period. It. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from lack of experience or um, it's, uh, and it's not legal an records, yeah. it's it's not an ex and it's not an experience thing. You know, it's it's really about the quality of the individuals that are that that you're going to support. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't stress it enough. Yeah, one one thing we advise our clients on is that you know it's it's almost like some some clients view the the entrepreneur investor relationship as a, as a as a battle of sorts. 
and we say, wait a second, you don't just like win and get the money and then everything is, is like, you, you never <laughs> talk to them again. This is a, this is a long-term uh, marriage, this is a partnership. Is and if you're a jerk, um, they don't want to work with you, right? So make sure you're a nice person. These are many, many and, hours and often uncomfortable and to, conversations. And to that point, when I said, you know, experience notwithstanding, everybody has to do, do something for the first time, right? And so that goes back to my suggestion, take a risk and, and do it. Um, I, on a daily basis, I meet young, uh, you know, aggressive, very motivated and passionate people who I would support all day long and have tremendous, tremendous potential. What they need is to know that there's support around them to take that risk. And, and that's what, you know, as, as I cruise, I used to be the young guy in the room, and all of a sudden it's not so much anymore. But that- I see the socks though, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying, <laughs> clearly, desperately. <laughs> we all saw it, right? Um, how about, um, uh, that the socks threw me off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, me Intended measuring effect. measuring success. Obviously, financial metrics, IRR, equity multiple, etc., are important. What other metrics uh, would you track on the social impact or environmental impact that then you then prioritize internally as a key part of the decision making factor? It's pretty obvious for for you guys, Chris. But but and how do you how do you report some of those externally? And, and are you held accountable for non financial metrics? Think on the 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 you know, ENS of ESG, perhaps? Well, so, so if we, uh, we have some um, LPs who are interested in, in those metrics, and the way that we've handled it is, you know, it's because our, our, our companies are fairly diverse in terms of what they're actually doing, right? One in ag, one in energy, we actually do some things in healthcare. The, the, the metrics are all gonna be different, and so we don't try to overlay some standard template and force companies to kind of generate something that matches that. Instead, it's a conversation we have with entrepreneurs around you know, what are their objectives as they're thinking about kind of the non-financial metrics for their business, and, and, and that's something that we try to just pull, in some cases, it's gallons of water saved, in mm -hmm. some cases, it's carbon reduction. You know, it, it can be a, a range of things, but we just try to really work with the company because they're gonna have the best view of you know, what they're trying to achieve, what their mission is. Right? They, they, they will inherently kind of focus on how they measure success in achieving that, and we'll just take that. Okay. Well, I think we're covered over here, guys, right? <laughs> How about um, some of you mentioned investing in agriculture-focused uh, uh, projects? I think we've given lots of love to, to other topics in, in resource efficiency today so far, but how about comments on maybe specific types of investments or strategies in the, in the ag space? Sure. You want to go ahead? And... Alternative proteins, dairy, food waste, hydroponics. Um, can you, yeah. I think I know where you're going, but can you say more about the alternative proteins? Um, there are cultured meats. You know, the, if, you, if you look at you know uh, sources of greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. um, the cow is a is a, a, a primary emitter, mm -hmm. if you will. And finding palatable alternative proteins is is part of our uh, is part of our thesis in in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And we're we're seeing some really interesting products. Dairy, you know, alternatives in the dairy space are, are, are really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes down to texture and taste and it all, it's, it's science and it's art and you know, it's, it's really interesting and it's really accelerating. Yeah, my, my, my wife is testing a, a vegan diet. God bless me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was vegetarian for a long time, so it's, it's, all, it's all good. But our fridge is full of these, these uh, cartons to sample of coconut and almond and, and whatnot. I tasted a chicken nugget the other day that was better than the ones I buy my kids at, at Costco. <laughs> and I'll put a plug in, Ripple is one of the companies, we're unaffiliated with it, but Ripple is a new company, which mm -hmm. is the founder of Method, yep. who's, who's one of the mm -hmm. co-founders yep. of this. And they've, we, we, we have switched in the past couple of weeks, actually, since I tried it at another event, to, to that as a substitute for milk. And it's terrific. It's actually so. There's some, really, yeah, so there's some really, some really interesting <laughs> products that are that are hitting market. Yep. There's a lot of innovation okay. in that space. Uh, how about um, uh, on the, the the equity side of things in the communities where your companies are investing or where the assets are based? How do you balance financial returns from projects with other stakeholder concerns? Let's say more broadly. 
for Edison, that's something that's very, very important, um, especially because we do have a lot of transmission and distribution lines. So we're very closely with our local communities um, and support them every way that we can, especially um, underprivileged communities. And if you look at underprivileged communities and environmental issues, you find a lot worse um, in quarter, especially in the LA region, say from the ship channel up to a major warehouse centers and a lot of traffic flowing through there. And we're working very hard to find electric solutions, electric vehicle solutions to move that um, crate from or um, up to those warehouses. And that's just very important to us as a company. And, and, and that, may, that was a good question. That, that may sound like a non-financing uh, question, but, but it, it, it's, it, look, it's the right thing to do to, to have good relations with stakeholders nearby or otherwise, um, but, but not having proper stakeholder relations cre can create significant uh, disruption to, 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 to your core business, license to operate, uh, et cetera, so also a, a, certainly a financial reason to do that. Um, this question is, is about uh, regions like Research Triangle Park. Um, um, what, can, what can we do perhaps to increase our, our, our visibility to the you know, broader financial community to look here for you know, new, new companies and so forth to, uh, to finance? Well, as part of our, our early effort to, at creating a culture at BEV, we are we're actively engaging with stakeholders throughout the, through, throughout the community. And, and trying to understand what's important to them and, and express what we think the big problems are that we want solved. So engage with us. Don't be, please just, if you have a big idea, if you think you can change, make a, a, a big impact on, on uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and, and the climate, you know where to reach us. Yeah, we, and we, we are, uh, we're investing across the U.S. We've, we've invested in Cincinnati and Indianapolis and Maryland and Chicago and Minneapolis. So we're actually, we think there's great innovation happening outside the barrier, particularly in the themes that we care about, where there's a lot of sector expertise. And so we would love to find opportunities here. The, the one consistent thing that I've seen, and I don't want to, uh, to, to kind of paint all entrepreneurs outside the barrier with this brush, but there is so much ambition and just raw kind of like, you know, belief that you will create something that is impossible in the Bay Area that then when we go to some other parts of the company, oftentimes folks are actually too measured, right, in terms of, in, in terms of the conviction and being able to achieve something really large and impactful. And sometimes that's actually governed by they're early investors, and sometimes there's a mindset of, hey, we've got seed investors around the table who are trying to fund a business that wants to get, you know, kind of the break even as quickly as we can, and, and you know, therefore they may be sacrificed being able to say, hey, if this actually all lines up, there's a much bigger, more exciting path for us to take. So I'm not saying be kind of foolish and try to raise a bunch of money and just go chase something that you, know, you don't have an ability to execute on, but if you think that you've come up with something that's really breakthrough, think about, um, you know, what, how, how big, what needs to line up for that to be a really big company, a really big idea, um, because, you know, I think that there's capital to, to finance that um, as long as you've got, got the vision. So under, under promise, over deliver, important, but don't make sure the promise <laughs> is still big, the vision is still big. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think part of that, that mindset of, you know, shortening up your, your sight lines is tied to, especially in, in our community, the, you know, the, the drying up of the pools of available capital you know, over the course of the last decade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Clean Tech 1.0 mm -hmm. was, uh, was an interesting experiment, and I think a lot of good things came from it. Um, there were some unfortunate outcomes as well, and what we're trying to do at Breakthrough Energy Ventures is fill that gap and, and give, give the community the, the, the comfort that there's capital here and we will take risk with you and we will stay with you for the duration. So think big. There's nothing wrong with hitting milestones. There's nothing wrong with your least viable product being a springboard into something bigger, mm -hmm. right? So. There was a question from the audience about um, emerging markets. Um, so maybe this is more, more for you, you guys, uh, Paul and Chris, that you, you do consider investments internationally. Maybe um, how do you source and vet those as easily and then there, there is, is often at least actual or perceived extra risk in emerging markets, uh, but also expected outsized returns as well. 
Uh, how do you balance, perhaps, uh, th those risks to capture those outsized returns? We are investing globally, on, literally on a, glo on a global basis. We've got half of our team is in either Ethiopia or Ni Nigeria right now, um, you know, evaluating opportunities on the ground there. Um, we're looking at opportunities in Asia. We're looking at opportunities in India. We're looking at opportunities in Europe, in Africa, um, in the Middle East, in um, in North America, South America. So um, we want to we want to encourage people to innovate all around the globe, and we want to make sure that they understand that we will invest in them where they are. Um, and so that's part of our mandate is to is to do so. So I mean, in terms of sourcing those deals, we have the very good fortune of having a, uh, a board and a, a set of stakeholders that have global reach mm -hmm. and influence. And so we see a lot of opportunity presented to us through that network. Um, and also because some of the folks that are behind Breakthrough Energy Ventures are on a very um, big stage, um, we do get quite a bit of deal flow from all around the globe and we want to encourage it. We want to we want to invest all around the world. Paul? Yeah, we so we we invest in companies that we hope will 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 take their product and business globally. But to get started, we're investing in companies in North America. The reason is just what we're doing is very relationship driven. You know, uh, half our partnership is actually in North Carolina today, so we also don't have kind of the team that's you know, to, <laughs> going to have it. But but what we know is kind of the process of of commercial uh, uh, validation, company development at the early stage, and that's a pretty hands on. Uh, uh, thing for us, which just means if you're building a business for off-grid solar in India or Africa, that, that's terrific, but those markets are different enough and you're going to need to be there, mm -hmm. which just means that it doesn't work as well for, for our model. But we'd hope you could start, you know, if you've got a product you can start with here, we certainly hope that it has the potential to scale into global markets. So there, there are a few more questions here, but in case you didn't add your question electronically, are there questions from the audience? There is a microphone and or I have a good hearing. Let me just talk loudly. Something brewing back here, not quite. Uh, aside from Bill Gates dropping another billion dollars, how do we attract more capital to this area? Well, I think success breeds success, right? And I, and I think part of um, and, it, and it's not just Bill Gates, it's, you know, it's more than 20 uh, individuals. Um, and what we're seeing is, what, what we hope to do is we hope to reignite the acceleration and adoption um, and, and the comfort level of the LP community to, uh, to come back into, into our space with, uh, with a more aggressive stance. And, and, and on that note, I think it's a good question. Um, I mean, you two are kind of unabashedly, thank you, unabashedly, look, we're, we're investing in clean tech. Uh, clean tech got, got a bad rap for, for, for good reasons and it's, it's growing pain uh, years. It, to, what, to what degree is there a, a need for branding, rebranding re around some topics that those of us in the room would use to describe these kinds of investment, whether it's clean tech and some folks, some LPs, limited partners, investors have a negative reaction or impact investing which is still niche and some investors view as you have to sacrifice returns to do, to do good. Is there a branding issue to, to get in part to, to, to Tyler's question? I think there is. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, that there are some people who still, to me, clean tech represents a certain type of investment during a, a, a time period that we've now passed through. And so I think you know, you're seeing people use the word sustainability. You're, you're seeing people use the word energy tech. I mean, I, well, I guess, um, I think that, and, and there's a, and separate from that, there's the impact question, which is there's a lot of people who think of impact being a concessionary style of investing. In some cases, it has been, but I think enough people are starting to prove that it can be actually a strategy to drive higher returns. It's absolutely not uh, concessionary in any way, and that that I think just aligns with with what we see is hey, there's a scope of opportunities that are resource intensive industries in the real world. And one of the things that characterizes many of them is a high degree of waste in their process. And so we're trying to use technology 
which uh, you look at the multiple curves that are driving opportunity in terms of cost of processing, cost of sensing, cost of panels and storage and the other things we talked about that are literally changing the structure of these industries, creating more flexibility, more adaptability. And, 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 and so we're excited about the way technology is beginning to impact the core sectors of society that we all rely on to take that inefficiency out of it. Now, if someone can come up with a way to like encapsulate that in a single term like clean tech, I'm all for it. But <laughs> One I, word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One word. We need one of those tiny URLs yeah, to yeah, summarize what you just said. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, the other thing is that you know a billion dollars is kind of a drop in the bucket. I mean, yeah. it, it is a lot, but um, you know if you look, look at Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, estimates from from last year, the number is something like 280 billion dollars globally invested in quote unquote clean energy. Uh, and importantly, look, VC plays a really important role, but VC out of that 280, you know maybe it's maybe it's two billion, maybe private equity is another two or three billion dollars. Most of this is, you know, it's, it's less risky um, asset finance, project finance, which, you know, you're thinking more about, you know, Trace for sure, and certainly, and, and you're, you're kind of stage agnostic, you know, Chris, so you all will touch that as well. But without the, the early stage risk taking that, that you're, you all are, are investing in, you don't have in, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, things to d deploy at the, at the asset level. So a billion dollars is a lot. The numbers, the numbers north of $280 billion. Um, so anyway, it, it, so it's, it's broader than, I mean, when, talk, when you talk to an LP or a, a, limited, a limited partner or, or GP like, like you guys, um, there, there are many you know, pieces to that, to that pie. And so uh, some are riskier and some are, are less risky. I think there's a, a, there's a, a Chris, home for, for all of them. Chris, to, to that point, yeah. Southern California Edison has proposed to spend about $12 billion over the next three years. And of that $12 billion, we propose to spend about $1.8 billion on these more risky investments. Mm. We call them grid mod, but we certainly are making those investments. So um, j just getting to your point yeah. that a billion dollars is a relatively small piece of that pie. Well, and if projections for, for the need to reduce greenhouse gases coming out of the, you know, the, the, the goals from Paris, if they're anything close to actually happening, you know, we need roughly a trillion dollars of investment in this in this sector per year. We're at roughly you know 300 you know billion dollars. So, you know, if you're af if you're off by a lot from that trillion dollars um, of need per year, it's still a multiple of where we are today. So, you know, the the problem is still is still real. How do you rebrand? How do you you know demonstrate success mm -hmm. to 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 increase the amount of capital uh, in the sector? We're close to time. I'm looking for uh, alarm clocks here, foghorns. Two minutes. Other questions? Yes. Um, what do you think that institutions of higher learning, such as Duke and others, can do to ensure that the labor force of the future has both the technical and the commercial skills necessary, that the types of companies you invest in will have the uh, capacity to meet uh, market demand? I just think, I think the fact that you're asking the question is a good indication that they're on the right path. I know it's probably a non-answer, but it, it's a good question. I think the other is, is, is interdisciplinary focus, right? W working in teams from different schools, which is yeah. how, the, you know, how the energy initiative here operates, how the, the entrepreneurship and innovation um, initiative operates here at campus. It's, it's across departments. And you know, that, 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 that's, those different perspectives is how you solve you know, big, big, hairy problems that uh, and, and I think Chris continuing to kind of engage about. industry, and, and, and you know, I think there was no energy finance curriculum here when I was a student, and there is now, and, and so, you know, it's the, the, the curriculum and the faculty being responsive to, you know, shifts in the market, engaging with, with industry to kind of understand a little bit about where things are going, I think is important. Remember, this is a 130-year-old industry, and it's hard to challenge the status quo within the industry, but within the university, it's wide open, challenge the status quo. Easy, cowboy. Um, other, other questions? From uh, we have what, like a minute here, is that right? Yeah, ten seconds. She told me. <laughs> <laughs> a speed question. This was for, uh, for Trace. Uh, CCAs in uh, California. How are they driving innovation uh, within SE? You know, it's it, CCAs for folks that don't know. It's kind of a Californian thing. Um, community choice aggregators, and basically they are buying and selling power over our lines. It's something that we support. Um, 
what we don't like about CCAs is currently they're not paying all of their charges that they should, and as a consequence, our other customers are having to bear some of that load. That's a problem across the state. But as far as driving innovation, they are doing something very different than it's been done in the past. Previously, we were the only market, so everybody would have to come to Edison to sell their power, and then we would deliver it. Um, the innovation that the CCAs have created are these different pockets that will buy and sell electricity on, on behalf of a single community. And then that community can go and do things like local solar or whatever it is that they may have. They may have different objectives than the state may have overall. So it, gives, it drives that innovation. So it, it could be really, really good. They're new. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. But, but it certainly is a new way of doing things. So guys, uh, th thanks a lot. We're, we're at a break, so come talk to us for questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.